ministry. Tonight, if you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John, the fifth chapter. We're going to be reading for our main text, verses 18 through 21. back up here. Get more. There we go. That's better. 1 John chapter 5, begin reading verse number 18. I've got some new glasses. And I don't I think they messed up on them. I don't like them too well. Anyway, anyway, the, I don't believe that part the bifocal line far enough up. Anyway, here we go. 1 John chapter 5 verse 18 says, And we know, whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one, and the wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of, of God is come, and hath given us understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God, and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Father, we're thankful tonight, Lord, for this church, Lord, and we pray tonight, Lord, that you anoint us, Lord, to bring forth a message, Lord, that will be, Lord, food for us, or spiritual food. We might partake of it, Lord, and grow in you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. First thing I'd like for you to notice with me tonight is, is the boldness here that John has as he, in these verses, how bold he expresses himself. And keep in mind, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you know, he, he expresses himself so boldly. And notice here what he says. He says in verse 18, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. In verse 19, he says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Verse 20 goes on to say, And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us the understanding. You know, John here is, says some very bold things, makes some very bold statements. But also, I want you to realize and with me and understand with me that also John here, he, he challenges us, doesn't he? Now, how many of you would agree with me that these are some challenging verses? You know, especially verse number 18, it, verse number 18 challenges me when I read it. And why did John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, pin these words? And there's something I want us to, to realize or notice closely as we look at the verse of Scripture. It's essential in the battle against sin, that our minds are focused on who we are in Jesus Christ. Not who we are by our own efforts or by our own understanding or, or by our own works, but who we are in Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ lives within us. And, it, and as he dwells within us, let's realize tonight that we are somebody in Jesus Christ. On the other side of the coin, we are no one without him. You know, the old song says, without him, I can do nothing. You know, without the Lord Jesus Christ living within us, we don't have the ability to do what God has called us to do. We don't have the ability to live a victorious Christian life unless Jesus Christ lives within us, unless he dwells within us. You know, it's not what we've accomplished by our own efforts or our own righteousness. You know, John says we are born of God. You know, Jesus Christ lives within us. And because Jesus Christ lives within us, we can live victoriously. You know, our lives don't have to be like a roller coaster. How many of you have, have been around people, or maybe you've experienced this yourself, that spiritually their lives go up and then they go down? You know, they go up and then they go down. In Jesus Christ, we should live victoriously. Right. We have the means wherewith, as Jesus Christ dwells within us, to live a life that's pleasing to God, a victorious Christian life. Our first main point really is the question. You know, how can this statement be true? Whosoever is born of God does not sin. And hopefully we're going to answer that question tonight. You know, John here is repeating what we find written again here. And if we go to 1 John 3 and 6, and 3 and 6 John has, has already introduced this, this thought here in the first part of this, of this book. In 1 John 3 and 6 he says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth had not seen him, neither known him. You know, John says, whosoever abides in him sinneth not. You know, John is saying as Jesus Christ dwells within us, we have the resources to live a life that's free of habitual sin. Again, it's, it's, it, the key to it is Jesus Christ lives within us. He lives within me. He lives within you. And notice here, 
sinneth not. In other words, does not, does not maintain a, a lifestyle of sin. Daily, if this is to be true in my life, I must maintain a close, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's got to be a daily thing. I can't come in here on Sunday mornings and sit and, and sit down for two hours, you know. Well, maybe I'm involved in praise and worship. I sit and listen to J.D. preach. But if I do that on Sunday morning, then Monday through Saturday, I go out and I live my life and I never read the Word and never pray and I never meditate on the things of God, I'm not going to live a victorious Christian life. I guarantee it. You cannot live a victorious Christian life if you come into church on Sunday morning and that's all of God that you get. You know, and certainly you're not going to live a victorious life if on, on Sunday morning you, you stay home in your pajamas and you sit down and you watch an hour of Joel Osteen or some other preacher. I'm not making fun of Joel Osteen at all, but if you sit down there in your chair and listen to an hour of that and then you go out the rest of the week and forget about God, you will not live a victorious Christian life. It's not possible. It's not possible. It's not going to happen. We see here that, again, the key is living in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, John says we must abide in Jesus. And since Jesus came to take away our sin, you know, John, 1 John 3, 5 says that. And since in Jesus there is no sin, again, 1 John 3, 5, then to abide in him who has no sin means that we don't sin. You know, we don't have to fall into the trap of habitual sin. You know, I've heard people say, well, I sin every day. It may be true that we, that we make mistakes every day. I hope in my life that it's not. I hope in your life that it's not. I hope we come to the place where we can live victoriously. You know, certainly Satan would like for us to sin. <laughs> certainly he wants us to sin. He wants us to be convicted and he wants to beat us down and say, well, you, you've done this and you've done that and there's no way that you're going to be a victorious Christian because you can't do it. And let me tell you something. He's right on that point. I can't do it. But as Jesus Christ lives within me, as I dwell in him and he lives in me, I can live a victorious Christian life. It can be done. As we abide in him who has no sin. Now it's important for us to understand what the Bible means and what it does not mean when it, when it says does not sin. According to the verb tense here, John uses does not sin means does not live a lifestyle of habitual sin. But notice here, let's kind of throw a little bit, of, a little bit more into the works and kind of maybe, maybe make it a little bit more confusing, it seems, but yet it's not, but we're going to explain that. But look with me at 1 John 1 and 8. Again, John is, is writing here and pen these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And 1 John 1 and 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, what about that? <laughs> You know, go back and compare that to the verse here in, in 3 and 6. It says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth and not seen him neither has known him. Yet, we've got to dig deep and figure this out. You know, if we look at the grammar here in, one, in John 1 and 8, in the case here, John is speaking here of occasional acts of sin. But, but, but if we go back to 1 John 3 and 6, the grammar of this verse indicates that John is speaking here of a settled, continual lifestyle of sin. Someone who continues to abide in sin. We can't abide in sin and live a victorious Christian life. We can't continually, you know, be in sin and live a victorious life. It's not going to happen. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, and let me assure you, if Jesus Christ dwells within you, he will convict you of sin. You know, he will convict you of sin. As Jesus Christ dwells within us, when we sin, we know it immediately. We know it before anybody else. What we do in that situation determines whether or not we're going to live a victorious Christian life. You know, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you thankful that we can be cleansed from all our sin? You know, keep in mind, that verse was written to Christians. You know, if we confess our sin, you know, if we admit to God that we have sinned, we confess that sin, and to confess means that we turn around and go the opposite direction. We confess our sin. 
let's continue to look at 1 John 3, 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. It, and now we, let's, let's tie this together with, with other scripture. Is John teaching her consistent with the rest of scripture? John tells us here that a lifestyle of habitual sin is inconsistent with the lifestyle of abiding in Jesus Christ. A true Christian, a committed Christian, can only be temporarily in a state of sin. In Romans 6, the Apostle Paul teaches us about this same principle. And the teaching of the Apostle Paul in Romans certainly ties in and, and agrees with what John says here. Romans 6, 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we henceforth should not serve sin. The Apostle Paul says the old man has died. He's been crucified. Aren't you thankful that the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your old man, your old, the old self, those old habits, those old you know, ways of living, maybe the way that you talked and the way that, the way that you treat other people, that part of you died. Aren't you thankful that's the case? You know, we have died to sin. There's no need for us to go back and resurrect that old man again. He's gone. He, he, he has died. And now we live a life, a new life, because Jesus Christ is living within us and dwelling within us. We live a life victorious because Jesus Christ dwells within us. The sinful man is dead. We're not to be a slave to sin. We're not to be, be controlled by sin. In Romans 6, 6, Paul shows us that when a person comes to Jesus, when their sins are forgiven, God's grace is extended and they are radically changed and the new man lives. Aren't you thankful there's life in Jesus Christ? You know, my life didn't end when I accepted Jesus Christ. It began. You know, it began the day that, that I accepted Jesus Christ and committed my life to Him. My life began. You know, the world is blinded by Satan. The world, much of the world thinks that we accept Jesus Christ. You know, we're dead. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing left to live for. You know, all the fun things are gone. Let me tell you something. There is fun in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there is a freedom in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. We're no longer in the bondage of sin, no longer have, are we controlled and have that guilt and that, you know, that, what word am I looking for? That conviction. Aren't you thankful that we're free, we can be free from the conviction of sin? It's through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ as he lives within us. Galatians 2 and 20. The Apostle Paul pens these words, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Aren't you thankful that the God that we serve, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for us. That's how much he loves us. He gave himself for us. You know, the world many times sees God as a God who's just waiting to just pass judgment. Nothing's further from the truth because God loved us so much that he sent heaven's best. He sent the only begotten son of God to come to this earth to live. He lived a sinless life. You know, he lived a sinless life and yet he died the death of a criminal. He died on a cross, a cruel, cruel death. And yet because of that sinless life, he was the perfect sacrifice making atonement, the atonement of blood sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. And through the blood that was shed on, G on that Calvary's cross, you and I have salvation. We step out today in freedom and we live a new life as Jesus Christ dwells within us. Aren't you thankful for that? So we see here that it is utterly impossible for a new creation in Christ to be comfortable in habitual sin. Let me tell you something. If you ever come to the place in your spiritual life where you're no longer bothered by sin, you've got a big problem spiritually. I'm, I'm being serious tonight. You've got a big problem spiritually. If you're no longer convicted of sin, there's something wrong. You know, your, your spiritual man needs to be renewed. He needs to be woke up again because he's, he's dead. He's dead again. You know, let, let's come to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and let's find that repentance. Let's find that, that new life that's, that's found in him. You know, the question is not, do you sin or not? We each sin because we have a sin nature. You know, we have, we have a sin problem because of that sin nature. We, we have to deal with that daily. The question is, how do you react when you sin? You know, what's your reaction? What, what, what do you do? You know, do you run and hide? Do you, do you, you know, you try to hide from God and run from God? 
or do you run to God? Let me tell you something. The best reaction is to run to God. You know, confess that sin. Get it under the blood. You know, get, get that thing taken care of so that you again, again can live victoriously. You know, do you give in to the pattern of sin and let dom dominate your lifestyle or do you humbly confess and do battle again with it with the power that Jesus Christ can give? Let me tell you something. Jesus is on your side today. Now, he's on your side. No one wants us to succeed more than the Lord Jesus Christ because he loved us so much that when we were in our sin, he gave all that he had. He shed his life's blood to cleanse us from our sin. Right now, we are, in, we are under the grace of God. We, we live in the grace and mercy of God. You know, today is the day of salvation. You know, we live in him and, and we walk in him. Let's go back to John. Let's go back to 1 John 5, 18 and look at that verse again. Again, again this evening as we go on. 1 John 5, 18. This, I really am struggling with these glasses, unfortunately. 1 John 5, 18. Let's read it again. It says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Notice here our second point here is he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and the wicked one does not touch him. The one that's begotten of God keepeth himself. Now how do we do that? We've really already talked about that, haven't we? When we sin, you know, we confess our sins and he cleanses us from unrighteousness. You know, he keeps us. He keeps us. Let me assure you tonight, you can be just as close to God as you want to be. If I'm not where I want to be in God or where I should be in God, the, the blame lies with me, not God. You know, God hasn't moved. Let me tell you, if you're not as close to God as you were a year ago or, or five years ago or whatever you want to, number you want to put on it, if you're not as close to God as you were then, what's wrong? You know, it's not God. God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But unfortunately, sometimes we change. Sometimes we, we, we stray away. Sometimes we grow cold in our spirits. It's time to get hot. You know, it, it's time to, to draw close. It's time to draw near. Let me assure you tonight, the coming of the Lord draws nigh. I, I believe with all my heart, the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Today is the day to get serious and live a life pleasing before God. Notice here, John says, He that has begotten God keepeth himself. And the last part of the verse says, and, and the wicked one does not touch him. If we are born again, we have a protection against the wicked one. A protection that does not belong to those that are not saved. You know, John is saying here, Jesus keeps you and, and I as believers as we abide in him. Again, the key to it is we abide in him. We, we abide in him. We read the word. We spend time in prayer. We spend time listening to anointing, preaching, and teaching. We abide in Him. It's a relationship. We've got to keep that relationship strong and fresh. We can't let it grow old and grow stale. We are kept by Jesus Christ, protected from Satan by Him. And notice the last part of, the, of this verse says, that wicked one touches him not. The word touch here has the idea of to attach oneself to. So John clearly says that the wicked one, Satan, or any one of his demons cannot attach himself to, cannot possess you as a Christian. Aren't you thankful that we have a protection that comes from God? You know, Satan can only come so far. He, you know, he can only come, do so much. We have a protection against Satan. Verse 19, John says, We know that we are of God. Aren't you thankful tonight that we can have an assurance of our salvation? We don't have to think. We don't have to, to hope. We don't have to say, I guess I am. We can say 100% with assurance that I am a child of God. We can have assurance of our salvation. You know, if Satan would, would like to do anything to you tonight, it's this, he would like to get you to doubt the fact that you're saved. John says we can know it. John says we don't have to worry about, wonder about it or, or, or guess about it. We can know that we know that we know that Jesus Christ lives within us and dwells within us. 
we can have an assurance of our salvation. We're no longer under the, under the, the dominion, the domination of the wicked one. And yet those in the world, you know, we live in a world that, that's dominated by sin, but we don't have to be a part of it. We don't have to be a part of that. Aren't you thankful that we can, we can, be, we can step out of that world and live a life that's pleasing before the Lord Jesus Christ and we live that life simply as we allow him to dwell within us? You know, we invite him in. Now, as we read the word, as we spend time in prayer, if we spend time meditating upon his word and upon him, we invite his presence into our lives. It should be a daily thing. It should be something we do daily. We should spend time with the Lord. Third point is here, we abide in Jesus and we avoid idols. Let's look at verse 20. Let's read what that verse says as well again. Verse 20. I am struggling with these glasses. Go back. It says that we know, and we know that the Son of God is come and has given, and is, we know that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in the Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Notice here, John says, We abide in Jesus. And he also, he goes on in the last part of that verse, he says, in the last verse of this chapter, he says, we avoid idols. But look here, let's focus first on, on the middle part of verse number 20. It says, that we may know him who is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. We must know him. John uses here a particular word for know. It's a Greek word, and I can't pronounce it, but I can spell it for you. It's G-I-N-O-S-K-O. And what's important about that word is this. That word speaks of a knowledge by experience. A knowledge by experience. I know the Lord Jesus Christ, and you know the Lord Jesus Christ because you have experienced him. It's more than a head knowledge. I can teach someone about the Lord Jesus Christ. I can show them the Roman road to salvation. I can show them... You know, I can quote to them John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish to have everlasting life. I can do all of those things. But until they accept him, until they invite him to come in, they can't know. They can't know because they haven't experienced it. We must know him by experience. We know the Lord Jesus Christ as we experience him. As we invite him to come into and rule our lives, we know him by experience. We, we know him by having a personal relationship with him. John also says that he has given us understanding. The work of Jesus Christ in us gives us understanding. He gives us understanding of the word. When we read the word, we don't, you can't read the Bible like you read any other, other book or, any, any, or like you read a textbook. The things of God are spiritually discerned. Now, as we read the word of God, the spirit of God dwells within us. That spirit that dwells within us will enlighten us and will illuminate the word of God to our minds. And then when it gets into the mind, it can get into the heart and we can apply it to day-to-day -day living. You know, the things of God are spiritually discerned. The work that Jesus Christ does in us, it gives us understanding. He gives us the ability to know him. He gives us the ability to dwell in him. And this understanding must be given. You know, we can't attain this on our own. I can't attain a really a good understanding of God's word in my own intellect. It's got to be from God. You know, the things of God are not discerned with the human intellect. But they are discerned as the Holy Spirit, you know, works in us and as God dwells within us. These things are discerned. You know, if God did not reveal himself to us, then we would never find him. No, God revealed himself to us. And we know him and can know him because he has revealed himself to us. You know, more than any other way, we know that God revealed himself to us by sending the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came that we might know who God is. You know, God sent heaven's best. So that you and I could have a relationship with him. He sent the best that heaven had to offer. And while we were yet sinners, 
You know, we don't deserve our salvation. I can never earn it. I can never deserve it. No matter how many good things I may do or might have done, I can never deserve salvation. It's through the grace of God as he sent his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven's best came that you and I might have eternal life. Now, Jesus is the key and the focus of it all. I'm the only understanding the ways of God. And we see the personality and the character of God by looking and studying here about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the same token, there are others out there that don't know the Lord. They may never read the Word. They may never listen to an anointed preacher, but they see God, the personality of God, as they look at our lives. Are you living a life that shows other people who Jesus Christ is? Do they know what you believe? Do they know the reason why you do this or why you don't do this? You know, do they, do they see the love of God in you or do they see someone who is hateful or someone who is, is, is short-tempered? Let me tell you something. We, our lives are a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you'd be surprised how many people know that you go to the Assembly of God Church in Barnett, Missouri. I'm serious about that. You know, these towns are, are small towns and people know each other's business. You'd be surprised how many people know that you're a Christian or you claim to be a Christian. You might not even know their name. But they know who you are. <laughs> they think they know who you are. Our lives must reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We must live a life consistent with what we believe or we become a hypocrite. Amen. It's as simple as that. The last part here of verse 20, notice here what he says, and I wish I could see it. It says that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even his son Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Notice here, John tells us here the importance of a true belief. Entrusting the true Jesus. He says he's the true God and eternal life. You know, Jesus here tells us, that, you know, excuse me, John here speaks of Jesus here. You know, consider with me what Jesus did. You know, we've already touched upon it, but he came to this earth. He took on the form of a man. He left the glories of heaven. He came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He died the death of a criminal. And yet because he was sinless, he was the perfect blood sacrifice for you and I and his death made atonement that you and I might have salvation through the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. He was every bit man and yet every bit God all at the same time. You know, that's hard for people to comprehend, hard for people to believe. You know, the Jews of Jesus' day, they couldn't, most of them didn't understand it, did they? You know, most of them, they couldn't believe it. You know, and it's kind of funny to me, they had studied the prophecies concerning the Messiah their entire lives and when he came, a big majority of them missed it. You know why? <laughs> they, they had their own ideas of what the Messiah was to be like. And Jesus Christ came and, and he didn't come in the way they thought he would. You know, he didn't act the way he thought he would. He didn't do the things they thought he would. You know, this man eats with sinners. You know, this man, he associates with those that, that, are, that are low lives. My goodness, we've even heard that, that he'll even speak to a Gentile. You know, their, their mind, when he came, he didn't come like they thought he would. And because of that, they rejected him. And yet, his love for them continues yet today. Jesus Christ's love extends to all mankind. No matter what our, our age, our race, our occupation, or, or what economic status we find ourselves in, the love of God extended to you and I it, it's extended today. Today, the grace and the mercy of God is extended. But let me tell you something. There's coming a day when the grace and the mercy of God is going to be over. You know, then, we're, then the world's going to face the judgment that, that's to come. You know, there's going to be, there's going to be a, a judgment that, that follows this period of grace. It's going to be a horrible time. You know, and some people say, well, you know, if, if I miss the rapture, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go later on. I wouldn't count on it. If we can't live a life for the Lord Jesus Christ now, how in the world are we going to stand up and die a martyr's death and, and go to heaven in that manner? There will be a few that do it. But let me tell you something. Today's the day of salvation. You know, the arms of Jesus Christ are open wide. And he says, come unto me, all of you that labor and heavy laden. And he says, I will give you rest. 
You know, today is the day of salvation. Verse 21, it says, keep yourselves from idols. Not too long ago, Brother J.D. preached a, a wonderful series on, on the idols, and don't need to say a whole lot about that. You know, whether it's the obvious praying to a statue, or whether it's, it's being, you know, making your, your career a God, or, or making a hobby a God, or making anything other than God that we place ahead of God can become an idol. My goodness, you can make your car an idol. You know, you can make your hobby an idol. Let me tell you something. I love to go fishing. It's not, it's not a secret. I love to do it. But if on Sunday mornings I'm out there fishing when I should be in church, or I'm out there fishing when I should be, you know, studying the Word of God or doing something else, I'm wrong. Jesus Christ must be number one in my life, and you're like, he will not be second best. He cannot be second best. You know, no wonder John closes with this, this statement, keep yourselves from idols. That is how we protect our relationship with God. That's how we protect the most precious relationship that we will ever have on this earth, in this human form as we are. Our most precious relationship is that with the Lord Jesus Christ. He must be number one in your life. My relationship with God must always trump any and all other relationships. He is the living God. He will be second to nothing in my life. If he is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. I know that's an old, an old, an old saying, an old statement. But man, it's true. If he is not Lord of all, he's not your Lord at all. He, he must be. He must be Lord of all. And He deserves all of our praise. He deserves all of our praise. You know, sometimes we, I know we, we call, you know, our song time, we call it praise and worship, and it, it's wonderful, and I, and I love it. But praise and worship must be every day. You know, when you come to, to God in prayer, you should begin your prayers by just giving thanks. You know, just praising and worshiping Him. And there may be even times when you come to the Lord, that's all you, you do. There's no need to even ask Him for anything. Just praise Him, just worship Him. He's worthy of it. He's worthy of all of our praise.